We are continuing today in a series here that we've uh, started in the new year at the Vine. We're calling this uh, Change and Chance. Uh, and there's a difference, just a one letter difference between change and chance, but that one letter changes everything. Our theme verse for this series comes out of 1 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul writes to Timothy and he tells him, let your progress be evident to all, which invokes the kind of concept that we all should be making some progress. But progress just doesn't happen by chance. Uh, it happens through change. And change means choices. And change means, you know, determination. Change means that, hey, we're going to be uh, focused on uh, the decisions we're making about moving forward. I don't know if you know this, but I, I think I've told you this before, but maybe this is new. Let's just throw it out there, though. But for a, a long time, at the beginning of the expansion of the followers of God, the, the people that were coming under the teachings of Christ, they actually weren't called Christians. I don't know if you know. We call ourselves Christians today, but we're called Christians today not because we adopted this name, because this name was given to us at the time of the expansion of the, of the local church. It was given to us by people who were making fun of us. So the name was at first invoked because in Acts chapter 9, you got people in the Roman Empire that were going, these these. Christians are idiots. You know what I'm saying? That, that was So we just adopted the name. We were like, that sounds cool. Let's go with it. Um, but they were first called followers of the way, right? That'd be, a, it, that'd be tougher, right? If you were like trying to explain that to your neighbor today, hey, you should come to my church. What's it called? Follower of the way. It'd be like, ooh, pass. I'm out. Okay. It just seems a little weirder, but uh, at the time, that was what they were going with. We're, we're, you know, they'd be like, what are you doing? Well, I'm a follower of the way, Long title, follower of the way. But f the idea of follower of the way invokes this concept of choice and change and making like a determination of where you're going to go in your life. And we're at the beginning of a new year, and we kind of think about those things at the beginning of a new year, choices that we're making. My wife and I usually sit down and start doing some of that yearly planning of what we want to see out of this year with our family and our kids and our life and all that kind of stuff. But the idea of being a follower of Christ involves the concept concept of change versus just chance. It's not just chance, right? In fact, think about it today. Even today, the concept Christian kind of has a cultural connotation that may or may not be the same as follower of Christ, right? I, I, I don't know. I got friends that, you know, I don't know. What, what's a good, a Catholic. I got friends, no, no offense to the Catholics in the room, right? I got friends who are like, hey, it's like, hey, what are you? I'm a Catholic. Really, what church do you go to? I don't, right? Okay, that's weird, right? When's the last time you've been in church? I don't know. Yeah, it's been a while. Did you even get confirmed? Not sure, right? It's like, but you, it's just Catholic culturally, right? Like, I'm Catholic by, like, lineage, right? I'm just in there. Well, the idea that there's a cultural name for, like, a thing that's going on versus a very specific thing about what you're deciding about your life is the difference between... Christ follower and Christian many times. And so I think that shows up in the name. In John chapter 6, we covered this last week, these large crowds start to swell around Jesus as he starts to perform miracles and teach. And he starts to delineate between people who are traveling with him versus who is actually going to be a follower of him. And I think those are two different things. He's, he's trying to cut the fat. You know, he's like, okay, we got people traveling with us versus people who are actually going to follow the teaching. And so he starts he start to invoke these hard statements, say these tough things all the time. Um, I, th I think he's trying to delineate between who's a fan and who's an actual follower. Who's an enthusiastic that there's going to be a free meal today, right? Versus who's an actually going to follow my teaching that's going to respond to the actual teaching. Kyle Eidemann's written a book. It's called I'm uh, Not a Fan. In it, he says this. He says, the biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. Who these? I mean, he has a bunch of those, you know, 
judgmental statements, Kyle Eidem and Jamie Christmas. Okay, but listen to the words of Jesus. They're just as tough, right? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus says, if anyone wants to, fo- uh, wants to be my, dis- my follower, follow after me and be my disciple, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. Those words would have been just as tough for them to hear. That would, have deline- that would be a line delineating between fan and follower, delineating between people who are culturally, you know, some religious system versus actually adopting the teaching of that leader. Are you with me? You ever heard of this? DTR, all the, all the, it's no big deal. If you haven't heard of this, it's no big deal. Ask your grandkids, okay? It's, it's a, it's a new thing. They have all this new language and stuff, you know, with social media and they're texting each other. But DTR, this is interesting stuff. DTR is just uh, determine the relationship, Right, it just means determine the relationship, and and this is <laughs> dating. Such a weird thing. Now we don't have time to get into this, but just trust me, it's weird. There's a lot of swipes left and right. It's it's funky stuff going on in dating. But here's the deal: like what happens is you get into a relationship. There's a lot going on, and then at some point, somebody invokes the concept: we got to talk about this. Like we got what are we exactly? Where are we exactly? Are you with me? Like I kind of think this is headed somewhere. Do you think this is headed? We got to have the talk. Right? Are you in it? Is this exclusive? What's going on? What are you doing outside of this relationship? All that has to go down. That's the DTR talk. That's the, you know, hey, we need to talk about where this relationship actually is. Well, that's kind of what's going on with Jesus. He's drawing a line in the sand, and he's trying to delineate about where this relationship is. Are you a fan? Are you a follower? Are you a Christian? Or are you an actual follower of the way? What are you doing with your life? What's our relationship, Right? In John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, um, I, I don't think I've ever noticed this before, but in 1 John chapter 2, there's a couple of verses right in the middle of the chapter between verse 12 and verse 15, where John, this old apostle, is writing to this, you know, kind of young, fledgling uh, Christian c- congregation, and he creates three groups. And I've never just really noticed this before, because the three groups are so, like, common to us. He creates three groups, and then he writes to those three groups this advice. In fact, he says this is the purpose of his writing in 2 John. He says, this is the purpose of my whole letter. The whole purpose behind this is to talk to these three groups, children, young men, and fathers. And and culturally, you know, if we were to kind of put that in a modern day language, that would be child, adolescent, and the mature, right? He says, I'm writing to these three groups. I'm addressing three groups in the church. There are people in the church that are, you know, there are children. There are people in the, ch- in the church that are just adolescents. They're growing up. And there are people in the church that are mature. And he gives, like, little tidbits of advice for each of those groups. Um, Eugene Peterson, who translates the New Testament for the message translation, uh, does some interesting work. He translates them this way, baby, growing, and veteran which I think is pretty good. I like the veteran. That's pretty good. We'll we'll talk about that. We'll get to it in a moment. But the veterans are, come on, we need some more veterans, right? All right, so here you go. Let's just go through it real quick and let's check it out. So babies, think about the visual picture, the metaphor that John's creating when he writes about this group. He says there's a group in the church and they're just babies. They're just getting started, right? They just are on their way. And it invokes this metaphor of real life. We've got some babies in the room today. I see babies getting held up in the back, right? Check this out. Babies, they cling and they suckle. That's what babies do, right? You don't have to go far. To, that's, that's, that's what babies do. That's all that they do. And there's an intimacy to that. You know, there's a closeness to that. The, the, the great difference between a person who makes the, the connection that moves from fan to follower, that moves from a, a cultural Christian to an actual follower of Christ. The, the, the greatest change that takes place in that person's life is in that baby phase where they move from the respect of God to the actual intimacy with God. If you, need, if you wanted to know, am I a baby yet? Have I gotten into this? Am I really into this? Have I really started this relationship? The greatest defining feature of that relationship is just the sense of intimacy and love that you have now new for God. Not just respect, not just like a sense of I get it, not just a, a, an intellectual understanding, but an actual intimacy that you have with God that wasn't there before. Listen to Luke chapter 10. When Jesus is constantly, he's constantly asked the question, how do I get eternal life? And his answer is, what must I do to it? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And then listen to this. Love the Lord God with all your heart. All right. So Jesus 
constantly drives the conversation back to love. And love is the most intimate of human relationships, right? And the, and the baby phase is defined by love. Are you falling in love with God? Do you love Jesus? Do you understand what he's done for you? There's a, a, an intimacy that takes place in the life of a person who makes this change from fan to follower, who's falling in love with God. It is intimacy that defines that. Or growing. Let's check this out for a moment. Growing is its own special deal. This is the adolescence. These are the people that spend a little time. They're moving out of the just intimacy phase. They're moving into a growing phase. They're starting to learn the teaching. They're starting to learn about Christ's direction into their life. They're starting to grow up a little bit. And 1 Peter chapter 3, he says it this way, grow in the grace that has been given to you. Many people, we fall in love. We're in love with what God has done for us and the grace that God has provided for us through his work on the cross. And then Peter comes along and he says, but yeah, you got to grow up a little bit, like grow up in the grace, right? You start to grow up and grow into his teachings and what he's instructing for our life because his teachings guide us into lives that are better in so many ways. Listen to what he says in 2 Peter. He says, add to your faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from becoming ineffective and unproductive. Whew, that's heavy, right? When I see things like that, that jumps off the page to me, the whole ineffective, unproductive, that jumps off the page because that means it's possible to be ineffective and unproductive, which is what most middle schoolers are. Are you with me? No offense to the middle schoolers in the room, right? I'm raising middle schoolers right now. These two words are constant for me. Like I look at these and I go, huh, ineffective, unproductive, right? There's a lot of that going. Adolescence is full of ineffective and unproductiveness. There's a zeal, there's a passion there, but as you're growing up, you're trying to add to grace, you're trying to add to your faith, all of these other things that lead to an effective and a productive life. And that's what's going on in these teachings. And that's part of the arc of what happens in the life of a person that grows up. I, if you're looking for like a negative, I don't know, I, I don't want to talk about this, but I, I can't, I'm just too tempted. Um, if you're looking for like a negative, if you want to know if you're in the growing phase, like the young adolescent phase, and you're not sure, you know what's like, it, it appears to be universal for the young adolescence phase for me, is the young adolescents are always looking at the people behind them, usually the people in the baby phase or just coming out of the baby phase, and they're always like, dumping on those people, right? And so I have that in my home. Like we've got little kids in my home, babies in my home, we've got middle schoolers and middle schoolers. They're just annoyed by the babies most of the time. Are you with me? That same thing's true here. Most, I mean, just saying, this is not directed at anybody specifically, but okay. So that's what happens, right? Is that people get into an adolescent phase in their faith, they're growing up. And so then they think they're already veterans. They're not, right? They think they're veterans. They're not. They're just in the growing phase. They're trying to add some things, but they're looking at the people behind them. They're like, would these guys shape up? Right? And they start looking at the babies, the guys that have just become believers who are still fledgling, trying to figure it out. They're just in love with God. They're just trying to figure this thing out. Their life's still a mess. And they look at them and it's nothing but judgment, right? It's nothing but judgment. That's how you know, just as a side note. Okay, here we go. And then the veterans. And then the veterans, right? There's not a lot of veterans. In fact, I think as a general rule, if you believe you're a veteran, you probably aren't. Like, that's just like a general rule. Generally speaking, if you said to yourself when you saw that list, I'm in the veteran category, probably not, right? That's kind of like the defining characteristic of veterans, right? You just, you don't go with, that's me. You have a humility that's come up over the years. You don't look at yourself the same way, right? And so vets know a couple of things. Let me tell you some things that vets know, all right? Vets know that growth is messy. That's what vets know. They know that growth is is messy. I was sitting with a group of guys this week. Uh, we have a men's gathering here and. And we were talking about growth and spiritual growth and the idea of continual spiritual growth. And we started the conversation, and it was very focused on the idea of incremental, measurable spiritual growth. And then we just kind of paused, and we, and we, we said, but that's not really true, is it? It's just not really true of how things grow. Growth is messy, right? So take, I said, for example, like take your marriage, right? I, I think most of us we like this clean line of growth. So we, we like the idea that you're, you know, 
you're one of the marriage, you're at point B, and you know, year two, you're at point C, year three, you're at point D. It just it just gets better and better every year. You know what I'm saying? And it's just up and up, right? But the truth is, it, 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 all the married people in the room, no, that's not how it works. It's just absolutely not how it works, right? In fact, what we were saying with this group of guys, I was saying, don't you realize that some of the worst times in a marriage are the biggest growth times? Like when you've, like even the self-induced screw-ups, not even like just, hey, things are bad, we had a health crisis or something. I'm talking about like, hey, I said something, did something, was thoughtless, whatever, which created a dynamic, maybe over a long period of time, that led to like an ugliness that we had to deal with, and only after we dealt with it did things actually get, so like, sometimes the worst things invoke better things, right? So growth is messy. It, it, it's like, it doesn't just work in this, like, like you're going up like one of the, like the, you know, the, the rides over at Disney on the incline, you know, you're just like, hey, look at us. We're just, and then you just cruise through the rest of the marriage. It's not how it works. But that same thing's true spiritually. That thing, stuff is true with God, right? Is that so much of what happens for what veterans realize is that so much of their growth happens in the low times, in the hard times, in the painful times, in the broken times, that it doesn't look like this. It, it this incline, it, it looks like this circular mess of like, hey, watch me, you know, tank this one more time and watch God pick me up and watch me build my confidence in that, my assurance in that relationship. And then we're going to ride this out for a little while and then watch, I'll tank it again. You know, like, there's a little bit of that to every relationship with God. If there's not, I would argue it that if there's not, it's because it's not really that authentic, right? You aren't really making the daily choices to deal with the brokenness of your life, or you're ignoring it, or you've become a hypocrite along the way, or nobody's pointing out to you, hey, there's some things to work on. Like, only in confronting all the brokenness do we make the growth steps. The same thing's true in a marriage, right? Like some of us have been, nope, nobody poke each other or look at each other, but some of us have been in marriages where things have gone bad. We just haven't addressed any of it. They've just gone bad a while ago, and we just let it go bad. And we just, we're, it's, like, it's like both of the parties are pretending, we're not going to talk about this. Let's not, let's not even bring it up that things have gone bad, because we might have to deal with it if we do. Are you with me? But only in dealing with this stuff do we actually get to a place where things grow. It doesn't just, that growth doesn't happen by chance. I think some of us look at marriage like, it's just going to happen by chance. We're going to be in this relationship and chances are we'll get better. Chances are you won't, right? Chances are you may have to make some intentional choices to work out some things. Are you with me? Same thing's true with God. Okay, vets know this. Vets know that strength is dependent on resistance. That's what vets know. That's what vets know. You want to be a vet one day? Vets know strength is dependent on resistance. Anybody that's ever wanted to get stronger, and I don't care what area of your life, let's just say physically, you actually have to do work out, which is invoking the concept of resistance. You're literally saying, I'm going to pick muscles, I'm going to put something in their way, and I'm going to work them until they get stronger. That's what it is. In everything. That's just physically, it's easy to see, but that's true in all areas of life. That's also true in relationships or work or all that stuff, marriage, children, the whole deal. You gotta, you gotta work through it. And some of us are some of us are amazing in one area and really bad in others. I see that all the time. That's that's my favorite thing. Is like my my wife says this to me constantly. It's like you can be you can be like you can be like great in one area. You're like, Physically, I hit the gym and knocked this. I mean, obviously, you can tell, right? <laughs> I mean, physically, I hit the gym, knocked this out. Kidding. Um, don't let me be your example. Uh, so, but you can be great in one area and then tank in another. You can know the resistance principle and still not do it. It's crazy to me, right? And so we kind of know this, but putting resistance in, in, into our life, embracing that resistance is where faith many times gets built. And vets know this. Absolutely know it. Um, this is the 14th letter in the Arabic alphabet, 14th letter in the Arabic alphabet. It's closest to our English letter N. Um, it is pronounced noon. Um, and so this is 
This is an interesting little deal. In northern Iraq, there's this city, Mosul, that you hear about all the time on the news. And in uh, 2014, uh, ISIS had kind of overrun Mosul and issued a basically an evacuation order to all Christians living in Mosul. At the time, the UN estimated there was about 3,000 Christians living in Mosul, which is a pretty large uh, group of Christians living in just one city that is particularly um, defined by Islam, most of, the, uh, most of the area. And so they issued, ISIS had kind of overrun this area, and they issued this. They said, look, you got to be out by July 19th, July 19th, um, or you'll have to renounce Christ, pay a fine, or die by the sword. Right? And so literally there's this mass exodus that kind of happens in 2014. And this is what they did. They went around the town and they put this symbol, this symbol for the inn, right, on all Christian businesses and homes in the city of Mosul. Right? Let me show you some more, a couple more. All right. So they go around, they they kind of like I don't know, brand is probably not the best term, spray painted, whatever, marked these homes, these businesses, these people's residents with, hey, we know that you are a Christian. And the reason that they use the letter N is because in the Arabic language, the name for Christian is Nazarene, which is connected to Jesus and his being Jesus of Nazareth, right? Check it out. When Peter is confronted by the girl at the cross that says, hey, I know you, you're with Jesus. It says, were you one of those with Jesus of Nazareth, right? So that's where that whole deal comes from. But Peter denied it. And so here you got ISIS going around there, writing this in all over town to all of these Christians and Christian businesses. And they're saying, hey, you've got till the 19th. And and if you're not out by the 19th, then you better renounce and pay a fine or we're going to kill you. We don't, that's so far from like our realm of like worldview. It's so far from our norm that it's hard for us to wrap our brains around that kind of persecution. Church of England, when this was going on, the Church of England posted this in their Twitter feed. It says, we are changing our picture to stand with those showing solidarity for the Christians being persecuted in Mosul's. And they started the hashtag, we are in, right? We are in, which was taking the name that was used derogatory as a name of honor, of persecution, honor in the name of Christ, which has kind of been something that's connected to Christian history for years and years and years, goes all the way back to the beginning. February uh, February, uh, 2015, there were 21 um, contractors who they thought were from... uh, they were caught in Libya that they thought were just from Egypt. These were 21 Coptic Christians, at least that's how it was originally reported, 21 Coptic Christians who were contracting in Libya after the fall of Gaddafi in Libya, and they were caught, captured by ISIS, overrun by ISIS, and then they were taken, and on video, they were all beheaded because of their Christian faith. This is so far from our realm of like reality that it's hard for us to even wrap our brain around. But there was a video that was released on the internet. Here's the super interesting thing that you may not have known. This guy here in the middle, they thought it was 21 Coptic Christians. It was actually 20 Coptic Christians from Egypt. One of them, this guy's name is Matthew, he was from Chad. He wasn't even a Christian. He was from Chad. He was just caught up in this contracting group that was filled with Coptic Christians. And so when he was taken, they asked him, and this is on video, they asked him to renounce Christ. And this is a really interesting deal. They asked him to renounce Christ to save his life. And he said this, in response, he said, their God is my God. He was so impacted by their faith (laughs) that he became a believer at the time of his execution. What? Whoa! Whoa! I mean, like, I was reading through this this week and looking through these articles. It's like powerful stuff. It's Some of us haven't even heard this, that this has actually happened, that these videos were released on the Internet, that people were dying for their faith. It's so far from our realm of, like, every day that we don't even wrap our brains around it. Uh, Ravenhill says this. He says, the early church was married to poverty, prisons, persecution. Today, the church is married to prosperity, personality, and popularity. Who burn, right? 
with that said, maybe, miss, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you will never see any sort of public persecution, governmental persecution, societal persecution for your faith. Probably not. Probably not in our lifetime. Maybe not. Who knows? But probably not. Probably not going to happen. But with that said, just because we won't receive any public or societal or governmental persecution, we will all go through some pretty deep struggles in our life, whether they be financial or medical or relational or vocational or mental or emotional. Everybody in this room can probably find themselves in one of those categories where they're struggling through an issue and their faith at the moment of that issue may feel like it's faltering. What that's no is that real faith is forged through resistance. That real faith is many times forged and, and like shaped and, and created in the midst of real hardship and real struggle and real resistance. That's what that's no. And so when John is writing to these three classifications of people. He's not knocking them in this category. He's saying, look, there are people that have just come to faith, and the defining feature of those that have come to faith is they just, they're falling in love with God. They've moved from respect to, to real love for God. And, and then they start to grow. They become adolescents, but part of that growth arc is it's messy, that growth arc. It's really messy. Adolescence is messy, right? You should see my kid's room. It's messy, right? And then vets, what vets know is that real, the end result here of faith, and many times is shaped through all of the hardship. It's shaped through all of the real resistance that we have in this life. And yes, we do live in a time and a space where you're probably not going to be persecuted for your faith. I'm not even sure that's a great thing for faith. Because it appears that persecution throughout history has been a good thing for faith. I know that sounds crazy, but it's actually been a good thing, forging faith, shaping faith, growing faith. The church has expanded and swelled under times of great persecution because it does that to faith. But all of us personally are here with something that we're currently facing that may not feel like you know, governmental persecution, but it sure feels we're going to go home and it's going to feel like, huh, I got a lot on my shoulders, a lot on my mind, a lot in this home. It's going to feel heavy. And in that, I think John's reminding us that the fathers of faith, the veterans of faith, those who've matured in faith, they know that that isn't something to shy away from. That isn't something to run from. That is something you'd be scared of, that it's those things that will build our faith. Veterans figure that out. Real quick, vets also know this. It's time to give back, right? That's why you put a veteran on the team. You don't put a veteran on the team to be the leading scorer. You put a veteran on the team to teach the young guys how to stay in line. That's what you do with veterans, right? I just saw like, what? maybe you know this. What's Vince Carter played? He's played three decades now? Three decades. Like, this guy's played three, four? He's played four? I think since the 80s, right? 89. He came in in like 89 or something like that. He's played three? His 90s? Is it three? Can we get a Google verify that? Okay, real quick. I don't want to put out false stuff. Okay. 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 Yeah, you get out of here. All right. So three decades though. He, he's a basketball player. He's played three decades in the NBA. Three decades? That's insane. But guess what? You know what? In part, you know why they keep this guy around? They put him on this team with all these knuckleheads, and they're like, look, you tell those guys how to stay in line, right? He's done it right. He's figured out how to do it right. And you put veterans on the team because they know how to do it right. They don't fall into the same pitfalls as the guys that are just coming out of high school now trying to get millions of dollars and play in this league. You put veterans on the team because they know. They've grown up. They've got some experience. They've overcome the resistance, so to speak. Churches need these three. They need these three groups, right? They need people who are just falling in love with God, right? And they need a safe place to land. 
when they start falling in love with God. They need a place where they're not looked down upon, judged, that they don't have this like standard that they have to reach, that they're just fall, they can fall in love with God and move at their pace, right? And, and we, and Vine, we're great. We, we can collect as many adolescents as possible. We're like the middle school of church. We, we, we know how to get adolescents to church. Like that's our thing, right? But the church needs veterans too. They need, they need people who have spent a lot of time. In the, and I'm not, I'm not talking about age when I say this, right? I think everybody in the room is like, oh, I'm retired. I guess I'm a vet. Not, not true, right? Because here's the deal with like spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity works on the, you know, I don't know, the same process, the same mathematical process as rate multiplied by time equals distance, right? Rate multiplied by time equals distance, which means, you know, you, you could have spent a lot of time in the faith, but if you've been moving at a pretty slow rate, you haven't gone very far, right? So you could be here for like 25, 30, 40 years, but if you haven't really bared down and made some choices and been dedicated and tried, you know, to wa- add to your faith, faith, love and godliness and all these things, guess what? You're not a vet. Okay, but I know some. I know some guys. I know some guys that they've been in for a little while, but they've maximized their rate, right? I know some young guys who I look up to in the faith because they've maximized their rate at the which they're traveling. They are dedicated unto the Lord and and seeing Him work in their life and making daily choices to honor Him. And that rate has pushed them along further. They're in vet mode and they don't even know it yet because vets don't know. Vets are like, "What? I'm a vet." Really? Hmm. Right? That's what vets do. But the church needs those three things. That's what the church needs. So we're in a series here where we're talking about what we're doing as a congregation and where the personal connects with the corporate. And so for everybody in the room personally, I think a, a, a DTR of sorts, a, you know, a determination of the relationship between you and God, this is a good time of year to do that. Hey, where am I at with God? Right? Where am I at? Where am I at? My babe, my adolescent, my vet. Where, where, where am I at with God? Let me think that through. Let me talk about the the choices I need to make to take the next steps. I think that's important, right? But corporately, uh, we've been saying this. Corporately, we've been saying that this year, uh, the changes the vine wants to make is that we want more mission work than ever before. We want more volunteers than ever before. We want more consistent contributors than ever before, and we want more small groups than ever before. And so I'd like to highlight this last one with you today. I'm not saying everybody, but I am saying we've got some opportunities for you to get and grow and kind of connect and deepen your faith this year. A couple things. One, if, let me just advertise really quickly. One, we're trying to do some things midweek here that are deeper than we can ever, you could ever do on a Sunday morning. And so those will be opportunities for you. We're doing more than just one thing midweek here at the church on Wednesday nights. We've got a, a marriage series that's going to be going on this year, uh, or started this year, starting in February. That's going to be going on. And if you're here and you're like, hey, maybe we should pile in and start working on the marriage stuff, that's going to be going on this year. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Um, we're going to be doing some really deeper study on the Wednesday night. It's going to be challenging. There's going to be, there's going to be some reading. You have to have some homework. Like you, you actually have to do something. If that all just scared you, probably don't come to that, right? Like maybe you're still not there yet, and that's okay, right? Um, we've got we've got a bunch of different small groups that have begun, and others that are starting, which are home groups, people meeting in their either home or around town throughout the week. We've got ch- some that are meeting during the day, during daytime hours. So if you're here and you're like, "Well, I'm retired, I don't drive at night," great, there's one for you, right? And so if you, but if you're like a night person, you got, you got like a full time job, and you can only do nights, but you need something that fits the family or the, the location or whatever. There's those small groups that are starting, there's a whole bunch of sign-up sheets in the back. Sandy's going to be standing back there after the service. She'd love to walk you through those different opportunities. All they just say is, hey, I'm interested in this, and then somebody will reach out to you about, is, does this a good fit for you? But I just want to say this to you. Like, there's a lot of opportunity this year, whether it's Wednesday nights, midweek, small groups. We're even doing one of those marriage series on Sunday morning. We're doing it on Sunday morning, which means you can come to first. You're already here in first service. You're in first service. You're first service people. We're doing it in second service because 
those guys, you know, second service is rough. But you guys are the real spiritual people. You're up early, right? And so if you're interested in, like, doing the marriage series on Sunday morning, we're going to do it after, during second service. We're going to do it on Sunday mornings in February after, during second service. So if you want to come to first service and go to the marriage series in second service, you can do that. Like, there's a bunch of opportunities this year to get connected in a smaller setting where you really get challenged and discuss and talk about life and how the teaching of Jesus applies, whether it's in your home or to your life or to your own spiritual maturity. I want to challenge you to think that through this year. Try that this year. Maybe slip into a small group this year for the first time. The people that are in small groups at this congregation, trust me, the people that are in small groups here, they love their small group. Right? I got a group of guys that I meet with on, on, if you're a guy and you just need a group of guys, right? I got a group of guys I meet with on Friday mornings. We just do life together and talk about life together. I love those guys. You know, it's like, it's like cheers at that place on, on, on Friday morning. They walk in, it's like, Norm, you know, it's like, awesome. I love those guys, right? We do life together trying to figure it out. Um, and, but, the, but, people, but I got, I got one small group that's full and I said, Hey, can you guys take one? They said, absolutely not. We love our small groups. I'm going to mess it up. They love it. They love it. You should try it. You should try it. And so this year I encourage you try your small group. Try a small group. Get in part of one. Even if you're like, I'm too scared to go to somebody's home, there's plenty of small groups that are going to be meeting here at the church this year. So try at this year. Are you with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a chance to gather in your name this morning, study your word. And I pray that as collectively, together, we determine where we are in this relationship to you and, and are challenged by your word this morning to take steps to um, to progress, to have that progression be evident in our life. Father, I pray that as those words come true in our lives right now, your spirit would shape us, mold us, convict us to make the choices that are needed to honor you. Take just a moment. Don't let this kind of just slip by, but take just a moment and do that work. Where are you with your relationship with God? Maybe you're here and you need to take a step of commitment for the first time. There'll be folks up my left and my right ready to help you pray with you as you make that commitment. If you're here and you're like, man, I've been a baby for a while. I might need to move in the adolescence phase. Maybe, maybe I need to add some things. Maybe small groups is that next step for me. This is your chance. If you're here and you're going through a tough time, would you be encouraged by the Holy Spirit as he reminds you that this tough time will be what forges your faith and shapes your faith? Take this moment, think that through when you're ready. Come and receive communion.